Well, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Zeminski, and I was meant to be talking to you as part of Salisbury's Festival of Ideas. Well, obviously I still am, uh, but due to the coronavirus, I'm to be found in my small workshop uh, on the other side of Salisbury Plain here in Froome in Somerset. Uh, it's open-sided, so my talk will be enhanced by the sound of birdsong, screaming swifts and angle grinders. I have a favourite saying. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. And it may be said that the sentiment and meaning of Gustav Mahler's quote would be understood by anyone engaged in a traditional craft skill. As a journeyman stonemason travelling from uh, job to job throughout the West Country, I'm proud to be able to say that we are doing our bit to keep a few embers glowing. With this in mind, I hope that my talk may illuminate the power of craft skills and the use of traditional building materials that are both beautiful and sustainable to show how we may use the past to meet the challenges of the future. My very first project after leaving uh, Weymouth College uh, was as a trainee at the cathedral. And here I was working at the point of transition from the square plan of the top of the tower to the octagonal base of the spire. So how is it possible to transfer a square to an octagon? Quite simply by introducing an arch into each of the four corners. This is a device known as a squinch. So that's the square of the, the corner of the tower and the squinch spans or bridges across. What I love about this is that this is an uh, uh, engineering solution developed and uh, devised and utilised by uh, Islamic engineers to support dome structures. So uh, no architecture of Islam, no great spire at Salisbury. Uh, here we were uh, repairing ball flowers, uh, which are the uh, decorative lake motif of the mid 14th century that uh, uh, stagger their way all the way up the corner points of the octagon, uh, rebuilding the small grove of uh, pinnacles that surround and enclose the base of the uh, spire itself, uh, and using lime mortar to fill joints, uh, open joints that had been uh, opened up by the weather, and using using it also to fill cavities and uh, uh, repair uh, architectural details. But more on that later. Um, while at the cathedral I also worked uh, on the cloisters um, and one of my favourite memories there is uh, and this arch that you can see in the spandrel which is this part of the arch um, was that when we opened it all up the inner core had been absolutely packed full of encaustic tiles. Now encaustic tiles are the tiles that we find on the floor of the chapter house today um, and these were rejects that had come out of the kiln um, they had some imperfections on them, so they were crushed up, chucked back in. But what was really satisfying was to turn over these tiles and find these four holes, known as frogs. And you could see that the uh, tiler had just used his or her thumb to uh, make a depression, an indent in each of the four corners. And you could see their fingerprints. So as a craftsperson working in the cathedral today, or 30 years ago nearly, um, it was so satisfying to be able to um, almost feel and understand the people who were making and working there at the time. A couple of years ago we worked on the uh, ruins of Clarendon Palace which is where these encaustic tiles had been made. Um, there is a, uh, a kiln on display in the British Museum uh, that was excavated uh, from there in the uh, 1960s 70s. Um, but Clarendon Palace is the most romantic and fantastic site to work. Quite hard to work there in the middle of winter, I have to say. And also ch doubly challenging, really, for the uh, cohort of llamas who guard the place. Uh, used to be sheep that roamed around there, but there's something in the ground that would cause them to keel over. And the, uh, the llamas, well, they just enjoy eating the nettles and uh, staring at you over your shoulder. Um, here we were uh, removing really hard uh, cement that had been introduced by the Ministry of Works in the uh, 1950s, 60s, um, and uh, also introducing a soft turf capping to uh, shed water more uh, effectively. Clarendon's ruined flint walls uh, reflect the underlying geology of the area, 
Originally, they would have been clad with uh, limestone from the quarries at uh, Chilmark or Chicksgrove, the same material that the cathedral was built from. Um, maybe we should look at this map of uh, the geology of Britain just to give us some context. Um, so because all the low walls are built of flint uh, and it's really hard mortar, um, what tends to happen is that you get uh, it expands and contracts, but there's no give in it, so it, fr it tends to fracture, and then water can get into the uh, medieval core and cause it to disintegrate. Um, here we can see the uh, chalk is clearly defined. The open downlands of uh, southeastern England, uh, represented by the green, and that slash goes up uh, to the wolds of uh, Lincolnshire. And then just to the uh, northeast of that, in this blue section, that's the uh, limestone belt, which runs up from Portland, past Ham Hill at Yeovil, uh, past Bath, the Cotswolds, the Midlands, and then up to North Yorkshire. Um, what um, ties all these limestones together, generally, is the fact they were all led down in an aquatic environment. And uh, no stone reflects this better than this. This is perfect marble. Uh, in the Earth's core, this, uh, this runs through it in very thin beds, so it's always used in the incorrect bedding plane. Um, when limestones are used, they should be let down in bed, so that reflects how they were deposited uh, within the shallow lagoon um, or whatever in the Jurassic period. So this is the natural bedding plane. This has been um, used like this. And this is common to all Purbeck marble. Purbeck marble is the material uh, around which the cathedral itself at Salisbury um, was hung. This stuff is super, super dense. Just to illustrate that, I mean, you hear that, ring it through, that sounds like iron. This is bath stone. There's a different tone to it. Quite musical. Um, super dense, super tough, and this is pretty much made of just one material. So these are snails. I hope you can make those out. These are snails. And these are a type of freshwater snail known as viviparous. Viviparous. Um, which means, um, like the adder, they give birth to live young instead of laying eggs. Um, this, uh, uh, this column section had spectacularly failed so there was no uh, other solution apart from uh, to get a new uh, section from the quarry which we did on the Isle of Purbeck. Um, another way of uh, thinking about it, so this is a piece of blue lias pretty unspectacular. It's, it has a blue, you know, the blue bit is understandable. It has this sort of blue hue to it. Um, it's split in very thin beds as well, like the, like the perfect marble. But with this, what a treat was to uh, split one of these stones. They're used for headstones, uh, paving, uh, ledger stones in churches, and find this. This is a shoulder blade for a, uh, um, a plesia saw, very young one. Um, tip top, very pleased to uh, uh, find that. That has pride of place in the uh, Zimsonian. Um, and this can even be um, seen in these uh, forest marble roof slates. I just say that this is forest marble and like Purbeck marble, they're not actually true marbles. True marbles are limestones that have been subject to great heat and pressure in the Earth's crust. Um, and in England, a marble is simply a stone that will take a polish. So believe it or not, when this is sawn, this will take a polish. Perfect marble does take a polish and will shine dramatically. Um, this is a, uh, so this, this is used as a, a Cotswold roofing slate. And this comes from a job at uh, Castle Coombe, which is the very last job that we finished just before lockdown. Um, so here you can see the pyramidal roof of the structure um, that we stripped. Uh, the frame underneath was um, rocking around all over the place 
Andy Jones, my roofer friend who actually led down uh, all these, uh, said it was like an uh, elephant balancing on its trunk. Um, it's got this medieval structure that's thrusting through the, the middle of it. Um, and the uh, stonework supporting two of the corner piers was absolutely rotten as a pair. So we had to cut that out. Um, it was a real challenging, challenging job. Anyway, so this, um, this material from Gold Hill Quarry is what covered the roof. And I don't know if you can see how shelly that is in there. Not as fossiliferous as um, hamstone though. Um, so this is a section of uh, pinnacle uh, from a church. Lovely, beautiful hamstone. Look at the colour of that. Um, this is a, a very um, a high quantity of iron in its in its makeup. So the iron corrodes in the stone and it gives it that rusty colour. Same can be said for bath stone as well. This is bath stone here. Maybe I'll just chuck some water on that. Um, here you can see the the bedding plane. Hopefully you can see the bedding plane. You can see the uh, the shells that run through it. But this is far more uh, f fossiliferous. I mean, uh, this is medieval. Look how worn and uh, corroded and exposed the the shells are. <clears throat> Carved a new one of those. Um, where was it? Oh yes, okay, so, um, but last but not least, another uh, prize um, exhibit in the Zimsonian is this. So this is not a stone, this is lime mortar, it's actually a lime uh, render made exclusively from seashells. So seashells have been added as um, aggregate or ballast to the lime more the, the lime itself and the lime is probably made from fired seashells and this is fairly common from the uh, a, a fairly common um, way of gluing together building materials uh, along the Kent coast this is a Tudor brick this came from a Tudor manor house we were working on a long time ago but I absolutely love that it's got so much character um, but finer grained limestones like this bath stone, uh, make it very suitable for carving. You can get really nice sarises, the e edge parts, and uh, you can, if you're going carefully, you can really um, cut very clearly defined edges. So the tools I use have remained pretty much unchanged since ancient times. Um, this uh, mallet here is of uh, lignum vitae, and that is, um, pretty damn similar to a mallet that I saw in the Ashmolean Museum uh, in Oxford a few weeks ago um, and that had come from ancient Egypt and was about 4,000 years old. Um, my uh, modern equivalent is just the same. This is made of nylon but you can see how the beet over the past 25 years um, has, has worn away far less rapidly than this. I don't tend to use this much uh, these days. Um, so with um, with my tools, um, this type of chisel with a mushroom end is designed to be used with a mallet. Um, if it's just a, a plain straight end such as that, uh, that's where I would use one of my hammers. Um, so both of these hammers are well over uh, 100 years old I would say. This is a two and a half pound um, uh, steel hammer uh, and this one uh, is a real big beefy devil this is a four pound uh, hammer this is for uh, removing huge quantities of waste in very rapid order so I'd use that with a uh, with a chisel like this so this chisel was gifted to me along with these these two hammers by an old Purbeck marbler this has a tungsten tip uh, which at the time was the uh, height of technology. So this is quarrying kit or if you're uh, wishing to remove large quantities of stone very rapidly. No different to the tools that Michelangelo would have used. Um, indeed he reduced a block of stone 
um, pretty much exclusively with tools like this and then uh, worked down to uh, undertake the finessing with a claw so you're going from one point to a series of points um, and then the final working over would be done with a chisel like that that too has a tungsten tip to it as I say mushroom headed for use as a mallet now for uh, letter cutting um, and finer carving um, you'd use a uh, type of mallet called a, a dummy so that's a very lightweight uh, dummy um, this one here from Tarantes again this is a very old tools masons don't tend to throw their tools away um, but the beat on this I mean this is a bit too worn on that face and the same can be said there um, so I tend to use this face now um, but again this is more for fine carving um, detailing such as this the sharp arises and uh, and letter cutting so again this has a tungsten uh, tungsten tip to it so there you go there's a bit about my tools so when I left the cathedral um, I set up uh, with my business partner Andrew Sharland uh, our little company Minerva Stone Conservation and we've worked all over the southwest repairing churches uh, medieval bridges listed buildings um, for example uh, one of our earlier jobs was in the uh, stone circle at Avebury in North Wiltshire and uh, here you can see just in the background the uh, United Reform Chapel that was it's now been uh, made redundant um, the Puritans who built this for it is the only uh, Christian building to stand in a prehistoric stone circle uh, were so incensed by the pagan associations of the place that they uh, whole in a very wholesale fashion smashed up these uh, great sarsen stones to uh, create building blocks um, for the chapel itself great act of desecration in my uh, in my view another quite challenging project uh, one closer to Salisbury was in the uh, Avon Valley just to the north of the city uh, and the church of Littleton uh, this sits on the edge of the uh, Royal Artillery live firing area and uh, one calm evening it was uh, struck by lightning uh, that caused the finial for the finials the, the top of the top of a spire or a pinnacle this is a finial um, this is this is one that had been struck by lightning a different time and then had uh, exploded so I glued it together and used it as a used it as a pattern for the new one that we carved um, for the the finial and the spire well we went in to expect the, inspect the project the, the following day um, was just let down all around the churchyard like it had been struck by something far bigger than lightning anyway so we got the uh, components which were uh, again Chicksgrove limestone um, put it all back together uh, introduced a new stainless steel um, cradle to support the base of the spire and the and the new stone um, and uh, built it back up this is the new finial that you can see with a, um, uh, a new um, lightning conductor on it um, I think it'd probably be a good idea to have a look at this map from my book the stonemason um, of Zeminski's Wessex the defining feature apart from all the places that we've worked are the rivers and we tend to work on a lot of bridges so we undertake bridge work through the summer and this can either be uh, to a, uh, a medieval uh, road bridge such as the uh, bridge that passes through the centre of Bradford upon Avon um, the pack horse bridge uh, by the tithe barn um, or just a single pedestrian pack horse bridge um, what tends to happen with these sort of structures is that the outer skin becomes detached from the, the vault um, and that is always quite interesting because uh, they fill with bats generally Dorbenton's bats or the fishing bat and on this project here in uh, Bradford upon Avon um, we had to exclude the bats before we could uh, get going so that meant working from our pontoon we would sit with the ecologist um, 
he would, uh, he, he would have an endoscope and when all the bats had left in their hundreds, he would then use his endoscope to examine the, the space, make sure there were no uh, bats within the, the crack and then fill it up. And then that would allow us to uh, undertake repairs. So here we did fit in um, something quite uh, unique. We did uh, hollow out uh, an entire block of uh, ashlar um, bath stone and uh, turned it into a bat roost. Uh, we did actually make two of these, one for either side of the vault. Um, and what's interesting is that the uh, males congregate in one roost and the females with their children congregate in another. And uh, I, I checked them out last summer and uh, really successful. This, you know, we undertook this project in Bradford on Avon about um, getting on for 20 years ago now. And, uh, you know, the, they came back straight away, the bats. So as conservators, our role is not just to think about the built environment, but the, the wider environment as well. Um, what was interesting about this bridge is that it was built uh, uh, without mortar. That's to say that they, uh, when they diverted the river, uh, they dug out uh, lots of clay and used that as a bedding material. So, I mean, as long as the clay is kept wet, it's gonna work for millions of years. And then they just pointed up the uh, external face of the, of the bridgework. And that's something I've encountered a lot around Bradford-on-Avon. Um, you see it all, on, all, all over the uh, Kennet and Avon Canal, which is quite close by to this uh, Packhorse Bridge. And you also surprisingly see it in the uh, Anglo-Saxon church um, dedicated to St. Lawrence um, in, in the town as well. Um, and here I, uh, pulled out one of the, the cornerstones because it was loose um, and it had a bit of a sort of strange riverine smell and you know sc I, I scraped out the inside and uh, it was just clay still wet um, it had been in there a thousand years so I just knocked it back up and um, pointed up the, the new stone a very simple and straightforward job but one that really uh, very pleasingly allowed me to get to grips with my forebears um, so apart from bridges, we generally work on churches, uh, abbeys, uh, cathedrals, we've worked at Rochester, uh, we've done a lot of work at Bristol Cathedral in recent years, um, and I've, I've been lucky enough to work at St Paul's. And one of the really satisfying things about uh, that, I was, I was working in the, um, uh, as a trainee in the carving uh, department, um, and the guy who taught me, he was taught his craft. Um, rebuilding Christopher Wren's bombed churches in the wake of the Second World War. Um, so, you know, it's just this handing on of the baton just goes on and on. And that's so satisfying to be part of that. Um, so at um, St Paul's, as I'm sure you know, uh, the stone for that came from the island of Portland. I have a great love for Portland and I've explored it and have a, have a uh, small workshop down there as well um, and uh, Portland Stone was uh, shipped from a, a quay on the, the eastern side of the island um, uh, past the Solent uh, dodging privateers and uh, foreign naval action and storms uh, to go around the southeast coast of England and up the Thames estuary um, and here we can see one of the projects I was involved with. So these cherubs heads uh, look out at the uh, four cardinal points and they're absolutely covered with uh, these black encrustations of um, uh, sulfation. So these sulfated skins uh, tend to hold soluble salts behind the surface uh, and they, as they crystallize, so the soluble salts are uh, deposited as a result of uh, acid rain and airborne pollution uh, so we uh, we need to remove these uh, unsightly crusts which is a pity because that is the sort of background color of old london uh, but it is damaging so using a, a good old fine chisel a chisel like this we would just slightly ping off um, the black crust and then poultice to remove any salts that were laying underneath uh, I think my favourite projects 
uh, just looking at this map is uh, Sherbourne Abbey where we've worked a lot over the years we've carved lots of new pinnacles in uh, um, Hamstone again this is one from there that was um, uh, destined for the skip but it now decorates my garden um, and Hamstone is my favourite stone of all uh, the way it absorbs light and throws it around is absolutely wonderful but what I really like about Sherborne Abbey is uh, getting into the roof spaces because the roof spaces because the fan vaulting there is on a par to anything that was going on in uh, northern Europe at, at that time and what is so fantastic is the way that the uh, mason of the uh, mid 15th century managed to integrate uh, this fan vaulting into the earlier uh, Romanesque Norman structure and you can see this at the crossing of the arch where the original Norman arch is still there with a, a um, quite an interesting uh, keystone in place this grotesque character um, and uh, it's integrated so perfectly um, it's an absolute wonder Um, we've also done a lot of work in Bath um, here this is a job at Camden Crescent and it's this is quite a good case study actually um, so the uh, Corinthian capitals of the pilaster strips um, were very uh, badly decayed and the problem there is that the uh, quality of the coal that was burnt uh, in the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries in Bath was very poor indeed. Um, so that left a very uh, highly aggressive sulfation crust on uh, on the limestone. So the limestone in Bath is very soft indeed. I mean as, as you know this is Bath stone, this soars um, very um, very easily. Um, I won't demonstrate that now. Um, so that makes it um, susceptible to um, airborne uh, decay by airborne pollution. Um, so here we uh, cut out cavities very much in the same way as uh, at the uh, cathedral where we poulticed and removed the soluble salts. They expand just behind the, the surface crust of the stone. Uh, we poulticed them out to, to draw them and to remove the black sulfation and introduce lime mortar repairs. Um, problem is with uh, capitals like this and the volutes that come off them they they hang like um, they hang like pears and this neck here uh, that you can see in the in the drawing um, is a, a real weak point in their design so they tend to fall off so we've spent a lot of time around Bath paying our mortgages by um, picking these up from the ground and recarving them particularly in the Royal Crescent So I've touched on how we use lime, but I thought I'd better just demonstrate um, how we use it uh, in a sculptural context. Uh, this chap um, was uh, l looking after a uh, Elizabethan manor house in Dorset. Um, he's reached the end of his days and he'd just been skipped, which is a great pity. So he was copy carved and I fished him out of the skip and I use him for uh, these sorts of demonstrations now it, he's been uh, carved in the wrong bedding plane and you can see it quite clearly here this fracture that runs up runs through his chest and his ear here has um, ear here has delaminated um, so the first thing to do is to clean out all the joints uh, and pin him so we put a series of stainless steel pins through stainless steel doesn't corrode so it's the best material for this sometimes we use um, long clay pipes that we have specially made um, but each job is different uh, so here I've been uh, already applying some lime uh, mortar repairs to a big cavity that was in his chest and I think it's quite difficult to differentiate between the original stone and the new repair um, so lime is a material that you have to be uh, hugely respectful towards so it's uh, specs on gloves on and off we go um, 
So this is what we use. This was a lime putty material. Um, lime is created by firing limestone or chalk in a kiln or even seashells, as you've seen earlier, uh, in a kiln at around 900 degrees. Um, a soft burn um, to which you make quick lime by adding water. Um, and then as part of that process, you simply add uh, local sands, other aggregates, pigments to suit. So this has got um, Horton Brown, uh, crushed Horton Brown stone uh, in it from the Cotswolds and some uh, earth, um, earth pigments as well. And we simply, I've wetted all this down, I've applied a slurry just to consolidate the surface. And then I just apply this with a small tool. Just uh, so I've come back after lunch um, and I'm just keeping on uh, applying the, the layers until I get the right uh, form. I'm sure some of you out there are wondering why I don't just carve a new ear out of a piece of stone. Um, I'm a conservator first and foremost, so uh, I follow a philosophy of minimum intervention. So that means I like to uh, retain the maximum amount of original material as possible. Um, with stone, it's only possible to do that by applying a lime mortar. The um, damage, for I think it would be damage, I would cause by cutting out a new socket to accommodate the ear would just be too much. Um, but with uh, the, the mortar, um, you could look at it as dentistry really. You're, you're filling cavity, you're building up layers um, and you're not interfering too much with the um, original object. So the repair has been on for a few hours now, so it's just a case of uh, cutting in. Uh, it's, it's leather hard and um, just get it all to match in nicely. Um, but you can re get a really nice uh, open texture um, with the mortar and the colour starting to look right as well. Also use a, a larger plasterer's trowel for, for uh, repointing and general line works. Well, the use of lime is not only restricted to uh, the conservation of historic sculpture and the repair of old buildings. It really does have an important role to play in modern building practice. For example, if you mix lime with hemp fibre, you can create building blocks and wall boards that are highly insulated, as well as lime concrete. The environmental advantages of using lime are manifold. For example, it is fired at a far lower temperature than other modern building materials and it achieves a set by absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, so it is effectively carbon neutral. It will also do its job for centuries. Could it be at a point of renaissance in the adaptive reuse of traditional building materials? Well, generally architects and designers still utilise a very narrow catalogue of highly processed, high carbon materials. Concrete alone accounts for nearly 7% of global CO2 emissions. To address the huge problems our planet faces with respect to climate change, we really do need to reduce that 7% figure downwards. Of course, I understand that modern infrastructure, hospitals and the like, will need to use these modern materials, but need that be the case with the huge number of housing developments uh, that are going up around our towns and cities? The building practices of today are forced upon us by a lobby of multinational manufacturers of industrialised materials and this started when the railway network began to uh, connect our towns and cities. I write about this a little bit in my, in my book, The Stonemason. It was really nice for the publisher uh, when the publisher asked me to carve the cover. So this is uh, 
rendering of nutmeg uh, uh, whip it. An immediate effect of the triumph of the railway was the loss of the regional building materials that had come from the soil of each area. Homogeneity became the norm as new houses and churches tended to be built of London stock bricks under a roof frame of Baltic pine covered with Welsh slates. Regional and vernacular style virtually disappeared. But in a few places there was still, it was still profitable to use local materials and the old ways endured. Now, I in no way have the leverage or clout of a property developer or an architect, but I do understand the advantages of the old ways of building. And I am stunned at the lack of understanding in the wider world that it is possible to still build in a way that is both sustainable and pleasing to the eye. Could we be onto something if the use of traditional building materials were more widely and uniformly specified? As I've already said, we have a long tradition of using the vernacular building materials that were closest to hand. The castle coombe roof tiles, the use of bath stone, the clay that sticks together the stones of the Anglo-Saxon church of Bradford-on-Avon that have been doing so for the past thousand years. What these have in common is that they are extremely durable as materials, but only if they are well maintained. But they are also in possession of an often unappreciated beauty. We know about stone and lime, to that you could add brick, but what else could we use? Could the answer literally lie in the earth beneath our feet? From time to time we've put down our chisels and mallets and swapped them for flat bladed shovels and rammers such as this one when we've become mud masons, when we undertake repairs to the ancient and often overlooked walls of Cobb that are a common enough site throughout Wiltshire, Dorset and Devon where Cobb built houses of Elizabethan dates and not uncommon. Hereabouts, cob walls are constructed from chalk mud that has been mixed with straw and pitched course upon course without the aid of shuttering. These mud walls, built on a stone plinth and topped off with a generously eaved roof of tile or thatch, if correctly maintained will last for many centuries. Surprisingly, neglect is less troublesome than repair with inappropriate modern materials. What tends to happen is that if a modern cement render is applied, uh, or replaces a traditional lime render, um, the cob wall inside suffocates. There's no possibility of vapour transfer. So it suffocates, it becomes saturated, it slumps and it causes the cement render to fracture. Uh, fractures can very rapidly lead to localised or even whole scale collapse. Um, the remedy is to uh, shutter clear the site, sh shutter and knock up the cob for reuse and ram it in with tools like this. Or you can uh, use the old cob to make uh, blocks, bricks, um, and then just mortar them back into position once you've cut out a cavity. So fairly straightforward to uh, repair uh, once you have the know-how. In Amesbury, there are a trio of experimental cob buildings uh, put up at the turn of the century by the Ministry of Agriculture using the chalk mud that was readily available on site. Turn of the last century, should I say. Although extended, they still stand proud and are groundbreaking in all senses. Maybe it's time for a re-evaluation of earth construction where humble dwellings such as these could act as a blueprint for the future. Cost efficient, carbon neutral and beautiful. What's not to like? In Devon, there's a chap, Kevin McCabe, and he is making really exciting contemporary houses out of cob. Uh, this property near Ottery St. Mary uh, has walls that are about three feet thick. Uh, and so they not only offer insulation against heat and cold, but also act as a massive heat store. This allows cool nights and warm days to be evened out by a flywheel effect. So uh, when doors and windows are left open, that results in a change and cooling of the air in the building. But when they are then closed, the building warms up again through the heat stored in the thermal mass of the walls. And incredibly, this means that typically a cob house will take approximately 20% less energy to heat compared with a typical modern house. So there's hope for us all with these uh, old ways of doing things. Well. Thank you very much for watching what I, uh, my presentation, what I have to say. 
like I said, I just made it up as I uh, went along. It's not really my world talking to an iPhone for a couple of hours. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks very much.